So I am reading each sentence. Okay, so or before that, one week has gone. So I'll read out the summary of what we have read earlier, so that it becomes clear. Okay, so just one second. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, now I've got it. So, so man, this I am reading the summary of the previous paragraph. So, to get the sense of continuity, man is not free when in ignorance he is driven by the forces of nature, sattva, rajas, tamas. But who has given nature these three modes? Is there again another entity who has created nature? And her mechanical workings? Yes, there is a conscious being, the Lord, who is also the Lord is witness, Sakshi, knower, Jnata, enjoyer, Bhokta, upholder, Bharta, sanction giver, Anumanta. He all these things at different levels. Okay, so one may call him Lord, Soul, Purusha. Prakriti does the works in the cosmos. Purusha behind her witnesses, assents, agrees to whatever she is doing, bears and upholds. Okay, is like your parents supporting their children from behind. Okay, so it's exactly like that. You agree to what they have done. Then Prakriti shapes thoughts in our mind. Purusha. In and behind her is knower of thoughts and their truths. Prakriti gives the result of action and work. Purusha behind enjoys and suffers the consequences. Home to mind, life, and body shapes them, develops them. It is nature that does that. Purusha upholds and sanctions each step of this development through many lives. Prakriti has will force to make things work in objects, creatures, and men everywhere. Purusha gives the vision to direct and will force to the intended work. Okay? Now, this Purusha is not the ego which operates only at level one. Okay? All the Purusha, the witness self, and all these are operating only at level two. Okay? This Purusha is not the ego, which operates only at level one. <laughs> In the ignorance, Purusha is the silent self at level two. He is the source of power and also the initiator and receiver of knowledge. This mental I is the ego, is a shadow, a distorted reflection of the true self. Okay. So, ego has some sort of secondary reality, it's a reflection, it's a conditional reality. At the physical level, it is real. But as you go up, you find that it is not real, just like the shadow. Okay. A distorted reflection of the true self. Purusha is cause, recipient, and support for all Prakriti's efforts. Okay. Nature is doing everything in the physical world. But the divine is supporting Prakriti in all her actions. Purusha does not work. He is static, silent. Prakriti has a double status. Okay? In the cosmos level one, she is nature force, apparently unconscious and mechanical. Everything in the physical world, all the forces are mechanical, subject to the laws of physics. Okay? In the upper hemisphere, Prakriti, which is level one, level two, and level three, she is the universal mother, Parashakti. These are the two aspects of Prakriti, responsible for all action in the cosmos. The universal mother is the only worker. Working is all done always by the Prakriti, Shakti, the divine mother. So, the Lord, Ishwara, is always supporting. Is it? 
Now we can read what we have to read. Yes. Purusha Prakriti, the different words he is using, consciousness force. Purusha is consciousness and Prakriti is force. Remember that the principle is the same, whether it is Purusha. But as it keeps coming down in all the different planes, the Purusha puts on different aspects. At the highest level, he is Lord. And the lowest level, he becomes absolutely hidden by his own power. By choice. Prakriti at the highest level is the Divine Mother, Shakti. But as it comes, she becomes only mechanical and unconscious force in the physical world. So now he's using different, uh, three different phrases. Purusha Prakriti, which is the same as consciousness force or soul supporting nature, these are equivalent terms. For the two, even in their separation, are one and inseparable. They are always together in different degrees. Okay, Are at once a universal and transcendent power. So at the universal level, Purusha is there hiding behind the force and Prakriti is doing all the work in the universe. At the highest level, they are equal to each other. They are both, they are one in two. Shirendra uses the word bayum. They are not two who are together. No, they are one. Okay, as they come down, that one becomes a two, separate. But at the highest level, they are one. Again, we refer back to uh, icon um, science uh, you know, in our Indian temples, the Ardhan Arishwara, half man, half woman. These are the uh, representations. Actually, Prakriti is not feminine at all, but they consider it like that. That's why the Divine Mother. Okay, so, Very faintly, that becomes the, because in the physical world, it is like that, male and female. But actually, at the highest level, there is no gender at all. It is just consciousness and force. At the lower level, it becomes man and woman. That's why they use the word Divine Mother. But at the highest level, the Divine Mother is, there's no gender there at all. You know, in one of her mother's talks, she says that I saw my body in the supermental world and it was completely sexless. Okay? There was no sex at all in it. So very clearly, this is a human conception corresponding slightly to the idea in the physical world Man and woman. Okay, so the question of gender comes up. But there's no gender at the highest level. Are at once a universal and transcendent power. But there is something in the individual too, which is not the mental ego. Something that is one in essence, which is greater reality. So <clears throat> it is a pure reflection or portion of the one portion. The one Purusha at the highest level seemingly breaks himself up into 100,000 million souls and each creature in the physical world, there is a divine presence. And the divine presence slowly starts awakening and in animals, it is still developing. But in the developed human being, not undeveloped, developed human being, that Purusha that divine presence in the physical world becomes the psychic being. The psychic being is the developed, fully grown divine presence in things. The divine presence even in a stone that develops through many, many lives. Today only I was reading in the morning. Uh, the Tantra says that to come to the human level, you have to go to Srimadha written this in essays, Human and Divine. He says, Santra says, 80 lakh lives. Imagine that. You have to take slowly. There is a development. 80 lakh lives or more, Srimdha says. Okay, that's what the Santra says, not Srimdha. But it is true that it takes a long time. Okay, so, and then it becomes a psychic being and you have a, a human birth. 
all human births don't have a psychic being, huh? by the way. Only developed human beings are psychic. There are also many lives. So we get back to our text now. <clears throat> but there is something in the individual too, which is not the mental ego. That's a soul or psychic being. Something that is one in a sense with this greater reality. The greater reality, Purusha. It is a pure reflection or portion of the one Purusha. So I'm just using the word portion of the one Purusha is referring to the Gita. Amsha Sanatana. Okay? You are a portion of the divine. It is a soul, person. So I'm just using the word soul, person. P cap. Okay? So the P cap person always is from those terminology refers to the psychic being. Okay? The one who is there inside your at the solar plexus center or the embodied being, the individual self, Jivatman. Okay. So that Jivatman also is the Jiva is a word that describes any living creature. But the Jivatman refers usually to the individual soul. Remember that the individual soul is essentially divine. But it's a, it is doing a journey. Journey from darkness to light. Journey from complete ignorance to knowledge. And man is the halfway mark. So he is a Jivatma. The soul in, in man is a Jivatma. Individual soul. <clears throat> but as you keep going up, this individual soul becomes the cosmic soul. And finally, the transcendent soul. Okay? So, <clears throat> it is a self that seems to limit its power and knowledge so as to support an individual play of transcendent and universal nature. Now, to understand this sentence, we have to go back to the idea of the one becoming the many. At the highest level, there is one. And at the lowest level, there are many. So the divine also, who is one at the highest level, has to fit himself to this law that he has himself made. I want to become many. So the soul also, the universal divine soul, becomes a many souls. But the second law also comes in diminution and distortion. Therefore, the divine soul becomes the diminished individual soul. Okay? And why does it do that? Because it is to support the play in the, the play of body mind life. Okay? So <clears throat> if without support, the it will be a meaningless play. Okay. The support has to be there. <clears throat> So, so as to support an individual play of transcendent and universal nature. In the deepest reality, the infinitely one is also infinitely multiple. But this is in essence, I remember. We are not only a reflection or portion of that, but we are that. Essentially, you are that, but you have forgotten that you are that at the lower level. Okay. In deepest reality, the one, the infinitely one, is also infinitely multiple. We are not only a reflection or portion of that PCAP, but we are that. We are that. Thank you. Our spiritual individuality, unlike our ego, does not preclude our universality and transcendence. The word preclude means to exclude, okay, to reject. Okay, the word prevent from happening, make impossible. So it does not make impossible our universality. We may be individual and finite with the soul, but when it goes to the cosmic consciousness, it becomes universal and it can even become transcendent. So the possibility of the individual becoming cosmic and transcendent is very much there. That's what we are saying. But at present, the soul or self in us, intent on individualization in nature, allows itself to be confused with the idea of the ego. Willingly, it is submitting itself to ignorance. Why? Because again, you come back to the idea of the game, okay? The adventure. It is plunging itself into its opposite and is escaping and enjoying the, the journey. Okay, enjoy. 
the soul is enjoying. Okay, but the body mind life is sometimes suffering and complaining. But the soul is always enjoying everything. <coughs> it has better of the experience. It has to know itself as a reflection and portion or being of the supreme universal self, and solely a center of consciousness for the world action. In the world action, it becomes individual. But in the transcendent, it becomes the one, the supreme. But this Jiva Purusha, now he is using a different word. He is saying Jiva Purusha, but Jiva Purusha is nothing but the Jivatman, the individual soul. <coughs> this Jiva Purusha too is not the doer of works any more than the ego or the supporting consciousness of the witness and knower. The soul never works. It only watches, guides, supports. Okay. <clears throat> Again and always, it is the transcendent and universal Shakti who is the soul doer. All the Chit Shakti. Chit is always watching and guiding with knowledge. It is Shakti that does work. The Supreme, uh, wait, wait, I have to read the idea. Yeah. Again and always, it's a transcendent and universal Shakti who is the soul doer. But behind her is the one Supreme who manifests through her as a dual power, Purusha Prakriti, Ishvara Shakti. The Supreme becomes dynamic as a Shakti and is by her the sole originator and master of her works in the universe. Do you remember the, in Life Divine, you have a huge chapter, one of the biggest chapters. Brahman Purusha Ishvara Maya Prakriti Shakti. Okay. <coughs> Brahman becomes the Ishvara at the highest level. So that completes the, and there's a footnote. So we'll read that footnote. Okay. And the footnote is very interesting. Just see carefully. Ishwar Shakti is not quite the same as Purusha Prakriti. In other words, there are three levels. Okay? At level one, the lowest level, Ishwara is your individual soul and Shakti is your body-mind life. Okay? Outer nature. At this middle, the Ishwara becomes a Purusha, consciousness, and Prakriti becomes the universe. Okay? At the highest level, it becomes Ishwara Shakti, divine power and divine Lord. So that's what I'm really explaining here. Okay. Ishwara Shakti is not quite the same as Purusha Prakriti. For Purusha and Prakriti are separate powers, but Ishwara and Shakti contain each other. Ishwara contains Shakti and Shakti also contains consciousness. Consciousness contains power and power is guided by consciousness within her. Okay? Contain each other. Ishwara is a term used for the third level and Prakriti who contains Ishwara is Purusha. Sorry. Ishwara is Purusha who contains Prakriti and rules by the power of the Shakti within him. Ruler because he is a king, he is a ruler, he is a lord, master. Shakti is Prakriti ensouled by Purusha. Now note the interesting the words. Okay? Shakti is a mechanical energy, but her essential soul is Purusha. Consciousness is therein. If you want to put it in a very blunt manner, okay, at the highest level, consciousness and force are both involved in each other. Consciousness has got Shakti in itself and Shakti has got consciousness in herself. At the lowest level, okay, what is happening is that Purusha is guiding the Prakriti and Prakriti is doing all the work with his guidance. This is the how it is being put. Are always results. The Purusha Prakriti realization is of the first utility 
to the seeker of the way of works. The Purusha Pranati realization is the, in the level two, in the spiritual plane of consciousness, when your mind becomes silent, you realize that you are the Purusha, you are, not, you are the non-doer, and Prakriti is the body-mind life. All your universal nature is actually motivating and using your body-mind life as puppets. And you are only watching. Okay? So they are the level two, the spiritual consciousness. The Purusha Pranati realization is the first utility to the seeker on the way of works. For way of works, you feel that you are doing the work, but when you go to the level two, you realize you are not doing the work at all. You are only <coughs> agreeing to whatever the Shakti is doing in the universe. For it is a separation of the conscient being and energy and the subjection of the being to the mechanism of the energy that are the efficient cause of our uh, ignorance and imperfection. In philosophy, you speak of two different types of causes, okay? Efficient cause, material cause, and the final essential cause, okay? The essential cause is divine. The efficient cause is the Shakti which is doing the work. And the material cause is matter. Out of matter comes everything. Okay, so that's the efficient cause of our ignorance and imperfection. By this realization, the being can liberate himself from the mechanical action of the nature and become free and arrive at a first spiritual control over the nature. So at level two, at the higher planes of uh, level two, that means the intuitive mind and the over mind, you can become, you can start becoming master of your body mind life. Not fully, but to a great extent. <laughs> Continuity and the subjection of the the mechanism of energy that is the efficient cause of our mirror that is all. And by this realization, the being can liberate himself from the mechanical action of the nature and become free. Freedom, bhakti is achieved when the soul escapes from the body mind life and goes up to the level two then you feel that you are pure consciousness. And that famous shloka of Shankaracharya, Chidananda Rupa Shivoham Shivoham. I am not Mano Buddhi Ahamkara Chittani Na Aham. <coughs> Mano Buddhi Ahamkara Chittani Na Aham. I am not these things. I am Chidananda Rupa Chit Ananda Rupa Shivoham Shivoham. That's what you realize when you go to level two. Yes. <laughs> now, Ishwara Shakti stands behind the relation of Purusha Pragati. Purusha Pragati is at level two. Ishwara Shakti is at level three, highest level. Okay. It stands behind the relation of Purusha Pragati and its ignorant action and turns it to an evolutionary purpose, a growth of consciousness. The Ishwara Shakti realization can bring participation in a higher dynamism and the divine working and a total unity and harmony of the being in a spiritual nature. That last sentence was simply saying is that the Purusha Prakriti realization in level two does give you a little power to manage in the lower levels. But the Ishwara Shakti brings participation in a higher dynamism. That means to say, the soul has the power to transform even the physical world. Okay. And your body-mind life, you can control very easily from there. At the level two, from spiritual planes of consciousness, you cannot fully control your body-mind life. You can control to a certain extent. And the divine working and a total unity and harmony of the being in a spiritual nature. The harmony of the being, body, mind and life, and all the different parts are all completely working in harmony when you reach the highest level. <coughs> you have many, many parts in you. You have a body, you have a life, vital, and you have a mind. But you also have a soul. And that soul is taking different stances at the different levels. Okay. So Then there is the inner vital, inner physical, inner mind. That also is part of you. 
Okay. So all this is absolutely harmonized at the highest level, the Ishvara Shakti. So we have got about 12 minutes, 13 minutes. So we can read one more time. Maybe we have not we have to read the yeah. If this is the truth of works. So one of you has to read. Shall I read? Yes, but we do. Read it. If this is the truth of works. If this is the truth of works, the first thing the sadhaka has to do is to recoil from the egoistic forms of activity and get rid of the sense of, of an I that acts. He has to see and feel that everything happens in him by the plastic conscious or subconscious or sometimes superconscious automatism of his mental and bodily instruments moved by the forces of spiritual, mental, vital, and physical nature. There is a personality on his surface that chooses and wills, submits and struggles, tries to make good in nature or prevail over nature, but this personality is itself a construction of nature and so dominated, driven, determined by her that it cannot be free. It is a formation or expression of the self in her. It is a self of nature rather than a self of self. His natural and possessive, nor his spiritual and permanent being, a temporary constructed personality, not the true immortal person. It is that person that he must become. He must succeed in being inwardly quiescent, detach himself as the observer from the outer active personality and learn the play of the cosmic forces in him by standing back from all blinding absorption in its turns and movements. Thus calm, detached, a student of himself and a witness of his nature, he realizes that he is the individual soul who observes the works of nature, accepts tranquilly her results and sanctions or with all or withholds his sanction from the impulse to her acts. At present, this soul or purusha is little more than an acquiescent spectator, influencing perhaps the action and development of the being by the pressure of its veiled consciousness, but for the most part, delegating its powers or a fragment of them to the outer personality, in fact, to nature. For this outer self is not Lord, but subject to her, Anisa. But once unveiled, it can make its sanction or refusal effective, become the master of the action, dictate sovereignly a change of nature. Even if for a long time, as the result of fixed association and past storage of energy, the habitual movement takes place independent of the Purusha's ascent, and in, even if the sanctioned movement is persistently refused by nature for want of past habit, still he will discover that in the end, his ascent or refusal prevails. Slowly with much resistance or quickly with a rapid accommodation of her means and tendencies, she modifies herself and her workings in the direction indicated by his inner sight or volition. Thus, he learns in place of mental control or egoistic will and inner spiritual control, which makes him master of nature forces that work in him and not their unconscious instrument or mechanic slave. Above and around him is the Shakti, the universal mother, and from her he can get all his inmost souls, soul needs and wills if only he has a true knowledge of her ways and a true surrender to the divine will in her. Finally, he becomes aware of that highest dynamic self within him and within nature, which is the source of all his seeing and knowing, the source of sanction, the source of acceptance, the so source of the rejection. This is the Lord, the Supreme, the one in all, Ishwara Shakti of whom his soul is a portion, 
a being of that being, a power of that power. The rest of our progress depends on our knowledge of the ways in which the Lord of works manifests his will in the world and in us and executes them through the transcendent and universal Shakti. Quite a big panel. And so what he's saying, uh, he is describing how the soul which is absolutely a slave to Prakriti, which is our body, mind, life that completely determines the reactions of the soul. The soul is my consciousness. I feel that my body, mind, life is completely controlling me. So if you are very, very aware, you will see that. When the body says, I'm tired, you have to sleep. When the body says, I'm hungry, you have to eat, you are asleep. But then, when you go to level two, you are not a slave anymore. You realize that you are a slave, but now you realize that you are something quite different from the body mind life. So, and then as you keep going up higher and higher, more and more you can control the body mind life from above. So, this is the transition that he is describing in level two, okay? So, in the spiritual planes of consciousness. Yeah. Rangata, one question. Yes. Even if we go to the spiritual level, can, uh, I mean, we have to look after the body, no? I mean, it's demands, right? Yes, absolutely. In so, then yoga, you are not slave to that. Yeah, no, in Sriyamdha Yoga, you have to do that. You have to look after your body and see that you are properly. But, in the other yogas, they don't care for the body. I am pure consciousness. Why should I worry about the body? It's all false. It's going to disappear in no time. That was your question, uh, no? Uh, yes, yes, Rangada. In, in, in okay. Integral, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Integral yoga, yes. If you are ill, you have to go to a doctor. <laughs> That's why we are dispensary. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. Yeah, so, I'll do one thing. Uh, there are quite a few interesting things here and it's, this idea must be very, very clear. That's why this, uh, he is describing here the Sakshi, Anumanta, Jyata, Bharta, Bhokta, Ishwar. Okay, he is describing this paradise. So, we'll identify all these different planes and what you are at which level. So, you can finish this next time. But today what I'll do I'll just read the summary. And then if there are any questions, we'll take up the... But it's a very interesting paragraph. with detail. He's detailing everything very clearly. Just one second. Yeah. yeah. So here he's saying, Spiritual experience, which is level two, okay, confirms that neither body mind life nor ego, nor ego, nor soul are the doers of action. You have spiritual experience, you realize that all nobody, your body mind life is not doing the work, your ego is not doing, nor your soul is doing. Then who is doing? Universal nature. Okay, she is doing the work. Okay, so it is only universal nature that is the sole doer of all action in objects, creatures and men. Even when we realize this mentally, a little bit of humility should come in. Oh, all the credit that I was taking for what I'm doing, it is not true. It is nature who is doing the work and I am taking the credit. So what ignorance? A little bit of humility must come in. Okay, so when you have mental knowledge. If that be the truth, it is obviously of the first importance that the sadhak should desist from forms of egoistic activity and constantly strive to see that it is not he who is doing the work, but universal nature that is responsible for all action in the world. You have to tone down your sense of I am doing and realize that whatever you are doing is actually being done by the universal nature in you. <laughs> through your mind, through your vital and through your body. Whatever then source of action, subconscious, conscious or superconscious, there is an automatism 
driving his instrumental nature. Instrumental nature, your body, mind, your life. They are instruments for the soul to act in the physical world. The source of all these actions could be spiritual, mental, vital, physical nature. It could be all these. It could be from spiritual level, it could be from mental level, vital level, and even physical level. The physical man, his body is doing everything, and he feels that his body is doing everything. The surface personality that thinks itself responsible and originator of all his work is only a temporary formation of nature, an unsubstantial puppet of nature, whose usefulness, once accomplished, is subject to dissolution and disappearance. So as soon as you rise to the second level, your ego disappears. It has done its work, finished. It was a scaffolding, and now that building is constructed, I don't need you anymore. You remove the scaffolding. The ego, a slave of nature, is a formation, a figure, a representation, a symbol of the self. It is a self-expression in the physical world of the self. So the self gives something of itself and it becomes a shadow and the ego is the distorted and diminished self if you want. Okay. It's an instrument of process, not a permanent spiritual being. Ego is not true at all, it just disappears. So the soul is then disappear. The soul is forever. Okay. Man thinks himself at first to be the external body-mind life. Body, life and mind. But he must realize that he is not that at all. He is a real permanent person. He can. Okay? This he can do by becoming the objective witness, the mere silent observer, detached from the instrumentality of body, life and mind. This detachment should enable him to be calm, unruffled, untouched by grief, pain, sorrow, disappointment, or the dualistic contraries. So you, if you reach the level two, then, and your witness self is perfectly experienced, you will not be disturbed by anything at all. Yes, at first, the soul person is only a spectator in the beginning. At best, only sending intimations, impulses, suggestions to the outer nature. But later, he must become lord and master after the realization of his true identity. But when after realization and becoming lord and master, outer nature may refuse obedience to his commands or sanctions because of the initial force of past habit. But the lordship of the master finally triumphs and Prakriti consents to obey him. Finally, from the spiritual planes of level two, he ascends and becomes the source of all action from level three. This is a supermental Ishwara who now is also the dynamic power whose will, whose writ, if you want, whose law now rules the physical world. This is Ish this Ishwara is also Shakti who manifests his will in the world. Through his Shakti in the transcendental, the cosmic and the individual. Okay. This is what the, uh, <coughs> the para is all about. So we'll take it up next time. We'll redo this one. I will enter, we will redo this one. Okay. It's worth uh, noting because it's a very interesting fact. Since Sunki is not there, I will put a note. Okay, good morning. Have a nice day. Good morning, Bonjour.